mandala because I study mandalas and I give courses about mandalas, you know. Mm -hmm. And also jazz because, well, my foreign musicians, musicians in since I was like teenager and still my favorite musician, even if it's like not really any anything like at all like you, you know, it's a sting, you know, that he make a lot of jazz in his career mm -hmm. and he's like mm -hmm. uh, very much like yeah he speak a lot about the inner world you know in many of his uh, songs and mm -hmm. it's something that i love about him um, so something that i love also about jazz is that it's never the, never the same i mean it have to be changing and have to be like this kind of cycle that grow or go, mm -hmm. go in the the individual so that reminds me the mandala uh the structure of the mandala in one way you know that is always like oh you can do the mandala for work inside yourself or you can do the mandala like draw the mandala and structure the mandala for express better your feelings to the world and to develop yourself in a better relationship to the world it's what i am learning in my studies but also uh, i can see that everything everything in nature have this mandala structure yes and this like i don't know cycle so if you can mm -hmm. explain us about this about this with the music the relationship with the music the jazz I mean, will be very nice. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic question and great, great experiences um, that you've had with the mandala. Um, I mean, I think part of my uh, academic studies with Debashish have been in integral yoga and um, and finding a horizon between kind of a Western continental mm -hmm. philosophy. I would say it's a it can be thought of in some ways as a non classical philosophy just like non-classical music it, um, such as jazz is there's a, a big difference between classical western music and jazz it's not classical for a reason um, which i won't get into here but i think that some of the philosophy that the western philosophy that i've studied i would i would i feel it working in that way and so individuation that you know famously coming from from like Carl Jung, for instance, uh, and there's a lot of other people that were forwarding the idea of, of, of you know, individuation as a psychic or a um, psychological process. Um, was kind of expanded in a way. It was it was developed through some of these philosophers, um, notably Gilbert Simondon who's a French um, uh, philosopher. And he really took the idea of individuation to a cosmic level. And so I think that um, that was really interesting for me when I came across his work, because in a way you could say that a mandala is almost like a blueprint of becoming. It is a structure. It is something that it, it stands in time um, mm -hmm. You can see the relationships between its parts. You can, um, you can, you know, the, the the symbology contained within a mandala is very deep as well, according to different traditions that you may study um, in tantric Buddhism, for instance. There would be a lot of a lot of symbolism that would that in some cases it might take years to to kind of internalize and activate in like medita meditative pro processes. And and in a way, when you say there's the mandala structure in nature. I think that it relates very nicely to to Simon Don's idea that is the, that the, the individuation, um, and we have we can experience kind of you know in more intensity like the psychic or like through the the through the the psyche our individuation, for instance. But we, many all other things are in in similar processes. Simon Don would say everything is in individuation. He would use the word. Um, co uh, cosmogenesis to talk about the individuation of the cosmos, for instance. And so there is something very much there about um, these kind of structures that we can see either mirrored or replicated or um, in nature that we can relate to as, as humans who are individuating. And 
part of the, I think part of the postmodern turn in Western thought was really opening to questions that yoga was addressing and Indian traditions as well, which is to say that it's not only the psyche that is individuating, or it's not only through the psyche that we can know ourselves and, and order ourselves um, and create structures or try to understand unconscious archetypal structures, but we can really open ourselves to so many different ways in which individuation is happening on a non-human level as well. And um, in Sri Aurobindo's, um, and going back to the Upanishads, he's drawing from the idea of matter, life, mind, and supermind as different kind of cosmic striations, if you will, that are all engaged in, in uh, processes of individuation that are of difference, uh, difference of, of kind, really, okay. um, on the surface. Um, and so I think that, but we can relate to them because they are actually, and this, this is sort of gets into some of the Indian metaphysics and, and integral yogic metaphysics, but really saying that we know ourselves, we, we really first know ourselves as different, different in kind, um, sorry, different in degree, but we can also through different types of knowledge, know each other as actually one, everything is one. Mm -hmm. And so, and that's in that way, I think that yoga helped me sort of move beyond the classical image of the human and how we can know ourselves um, into more experimental ways. And I felt that in yoga, um, in Eastern traditions, and my, my engagement with learning raga music was through integral yoga. And it really did open me to try to, to build relationships with, with um, different, um, different kinds of forces, different types of um, different, these different striations relate to them differently as, as in, I'm going to individuate alongside this or, or with this and see what, what happens. And so I th think that uh, the, the mandala potent, um, almost like I think Debashish would call it an eternal image that we can like try to, uh, we can try to engage with and see how um, we can micro and macro different regimes of individuation. So I just wanted to say that based on the mandala. And so music for me, um, I feel that after I felt that this after a certain time in India, that these ragas that I was learned that I um, was learning, um, it's all based on um, the, the 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 canvas of the the music is based on an instrument called the tanpura, which is a drone instrument. And it creates a tonal canvas that the raga music is going to be set to. And so in that way, the music, the tonality, or the, it's, it's in one key, to use Western terminology. And it, it kind of creates a center of gravity in which the raga phrases will constantly cycle around and resolve into and then create tension with. And we can think of that, that as the sim, uh as giving us a similar function to the bindu at the center of a mandala. So a mandala does have a center point, which is infinitely um, regressive. It's you'll never get to the absolute center. It's an infinite point that is, is constantly moving into, into infinity. And that's, it's kind of representing an interface that we can develop with the infinite. And the structures that are around the mandala, I would say in the visual mandala, would be the raga phrases and there's a very strong um sense of architectonics that's a word that was used to describe really the kind the of the musical um structure that is at play and so it's it's fascinating to me because at one point i really started seeing these ragas almost almost as if they were uh, mandalas in time like they were morphing it wasn't just one image that i was getting because the nature of music as opposed to visual art is that that this is it, like music dissipates in, in sound dissipates in time. So the relationship of music making and listening in time is different than the, the nature of when you're composing and writing onto a page or you're, you're drawing a mandala, the mandala, the, the visual mandala, you could also say is that when you're activating uh, with it, you're meditating on it, it's being perpetually reborn in time. The mandala is constantly like, you know, you alluded to uh, when you spoke, 
And I think that music gives us a different experience, but a very tangible one, um, especially in relation to time. And so these ragas, I started feeling that there was some similarity to, um, to uh, a yantra. And so um, Debashish um, has given uh, presentations on what he, he he's, um, talks about three neo-tantric artists who draw in, in, a, in modernity, like these is in the 60s, I believe, in 70s. Nice. Who, who kind, of, um, kind of started drawing their own interpretations of mandalas. And when I saw this presentation, it really gave me the, the it helped me see Yes, this is really much more like music to me. It's like we have a classical notion of a mandala, which is you know rooted in a tradition, which is has a certain symbology. But then we also can compose our own mandalas based on our own our own experiences and relationship to the tradition, but also our relationship to the world we're in, which is not that let's, let's, let's say the old older world of when these. these specific